Imagine this. You step outside to check the mail, but instead of fresh air and sunlight, you're greeted by darkness. A thick, suffocating wall of dust barrels towards you, blotting out the sky. It's not a tornado, not a wildfire. It's something far more subtle and far more dangerous. A dust storm. That was the reality for millions of Americans during the 1930s. On April 14, 1935, Black Sunday, a cloud of dust taller than a skyscraper swept across the Great Plains at over 50 miles per hour, carrying away entire fields of soil. Homes were buried. People choked on the air. Crops died. And towns were left abandoned. Here's what most people don't know. We're edging closer to that again. Across America's heartland, soil erosion is quietly accelerating. And while it doesn't make front-page news, it's one of the biggest threats to national food security and rural life. More than 1.7 billion tons of topsoil disappear every year, gone with the wind and the rain. And it's not just from farming. Climate change, overgrazing, and unsustainable land use are all making it worse. But there's a twist in this story, and it's one filled with hope. Nearly 100 years ago, the U.S. launched one of the largest environmental recovery projects in human history, planting a wall of trees across the entire continent to save the land. Today, that mission is back, and what's happening now could shape the future of farming, climate resilience, and even global desertification. Long before bulldozers and tractors touched the Great Plains, the land thrived on its own terms. For thousands of years, deep-rooted native grasses blanketed the terrain, anchoring the fertile soil through both floods and droughts. Bison herds roamed freely, naturally grazing the grasslands in cycles that gave the vegetation time to regenerate. Nature had built a stable, self-regulating system. Then came the 1920s, and with them, the Great Plow-Up. Attracted by high crop prices and a booming market, settlers armed with steel plows and tractors transformed the prairies into farmland. Millions of acres of native grasses were ripped up to plant wheat, corn, and cotton. But what no one realized was this. Removing the grasses also removed the very structure that held the soil in place. Without those deep roots, the land became vulnerable. Then came the drought. From 1931 to 1934, rainfall across the plains dropped by 40%. The winters were snowless. Crops failed. The wind picked up. And with nothing holding the topsoil down, it simply lifted into the air. Massive dust storms began to tear across the country. These weren't just dusty days. They were black blizzards that turned noon into night. Some storms stretched miles high and hundreds of miles wide. On Black Sunday, over 300 million tons of soil were displaced in a single day. Entire regions were suffocating. Health collapsed. Dust pneumonia filled hospitals. People used wet sheets to seal their windows. Many died. Economically, the region was devastated. Farmland values plummeted. Over 750,000 farms shut down. Families migrated west. Some 2 to 3 million people seeking jobs and shelter in California. This disaster wasn't just environmental. It triggered a social and economic collapse across the middle of the country. In response, the U.S. government did something unprecedented. It launched the Great Plains Shelter Belt Project, a massive plan to plant trees across the heartland to stop the wind and hold the soil. The idea, windbreaks, rows of trees spaced across farmland, could dramatically slow down wind speeds, trap moisture, and prevent further erosion. The goal was to plant a wall of green 100 miles wide from Canada down to Texas. It was ambitious, but the nation was desperate. The Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration took over, providing jobs for thousands. Farmers volunteered land. The government provided seedlings, tools, and guidance. Between 1935 and 1942, over 220 million trees were planted in more than 30,000 shelter belts, covering 18,500 square miles. And it worked. Within a few years, wind speeds dropped by up to 50%. Soil erosion was reduced by 65%. Crops began to survive. Hope returned to the plains. But then, things fell apart again. By the mid-1940s, the worst of the Dust Bowl had passed. The shelter belts had served their purpose, but the problem? They needed constant care. Weeding, thinning, pruning, fertilizing, all critical to keep the trees healthy, were neglected. Maintenance dropped from yearly to every three to five years, then to almost nothing. Without upkeep, many trees died. Others became overcrowded and competed for water and nutrients. Some species, like Virginia juniper, became invasive. Without natural fires or consistent maintenance, juniper thickets expanded aggressively, crowding out native grasses and reducing pasture for livestock. Ironically, they also increased wildfire risk due to accumulated dry brush. Then came the age of pivot irrigation those big rotating sprinkler systems. They didn't work well with shelter belts, which blocked the circular layout of the fields. 
So many farmers began cutting down the trees. The Cold War didn't help either. National focus shifted. Funding dropped by 60%. By 1960, the survival rate of shelter belts had fallen below 60%. A once ambitious solution had become a forgotten relic. But the story doesn't end there. Today, climate change and unsustainable farming are bringing erosion back with a vengeance. And once again, the answer is green. Government agencies like the Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, are actively promoting a new wave of shelter belts. Modern programs offer technical and financial support to farmers willing to plant windbreaks or restore old ones. And these new belts are even better. They use a variety of drought-resistant species, are designed with precision, and are placed to maximize wind resistance while supporting modern irrigation systems. Studies show these strips can cut wind speeds by 20 to 50 percent and trap snow in winter, adding crucial moisture to soil in spring. But the Green Army doesn't stop with trees. One of the most powerful tools to prevent erosion today is cover crops. Plants like rye, clover, or mustard grow not for harvest, but to protect the soil between growing seasons. These crops cover bare soil to reduce wind impact, hold moisture in place, suppress weeds, boost organic matter, improve soil structure. Between 2012 and 2017, cover crop acreage in the U.S. nearly doubled to 15 million acres. That number is still rising today, especially in the Great Plains, where these methods make the biggest difference. Remember how overgrazing helped trigger the Dust Bowl? Today, that same industry is helping prevent it, when managed wisely. With rotational grazing, pastures are divided into smaller plots. Livestock graze one area for a short time, then move to the next, giving grass time to recover. This allows the root systems to rebuild, reducing erosion and increasing soil fertility. It's a win-win. Healthier soil, better grazing, and more sustainable livestock production. This method is spreading fast, with farmers realizing that a well-managed pasture not only yields more, but protects their land long-term. You might be wondering, so what? I'm not a farmer. Why should I care? Here's the thing. Soil is everything. It's where your food comes from, your water is filtered, your air is purified. No soil, no food. No food, no future. The Dust Bowl wasn't just a fluke. It was a warning. And the fact that erosion is increasing again means we've ignored that warning for too long. But the good news? We now know what works. Planting trees, cover crops, rotational grazing, smart land management. Healthy soil stores, carbon. More vegetation reduces atmospheric CO2. More biodiversity strengthens ecosystems. The Great Plains Shelter Belt Project didn't just save America's farmland, it inspired the world. In China, entire forests are being planted to stop the Gobi Desert from swallowing villages. In Africa, countries are joining together to build a great green wall stretching across the continent to stop the Sahara. These efforts began in part because of what happened in the U.S. It's proof that what one country learns, others can build on. And that fixing the land isn't just about survival, it's about leadership. Today, many of those 1930s shelter belts still stand. Silent, weather-worn reminders of what once was and what could be again. Across the Great Plains, new trees are being planted, cover crops are thriving, and farmers are rethinking the land not just as a resource to exploit, but a partner to protect. So next time you see a flat, open field, look closer. That green line on the horizon? It might just be part of one of the greatest environmental comebacks in history. And the battle isn't over, in fact, it's only just begun.